Welcome back for, I think this is part five of the lecture on viruses. Um, I'm not always recording these lectures in order, so it gets a little confusing sometimes. Um, anyways, we're going to pick it up with, we're still talking about DNA viruses and the infections they cause. And some of these I'm just mentioning briefly and others I'm talking about in quite a bit of detail. The amount of detail that I provide to you, that's what you guys need to know for your lecture exam. And, uh, and as always, you need to take good notes. All right, I'm on um, DNA virus family number two in your outline, and this family is the um, Papovaviridae family, and uh, they have double-stranded circular DNA in their genome. A couple of examples I wanted to talk about. First of all, papillomavirus. This is um, a group of viruses that cause warts in humans, and um, the virus infects the skin or mucous membranes, direct contact uh, or contact with contaminated fomites. Those are going to be the main means of transmission. Uh, now, most people that are infected with this virus, it, it, it may be subclinical or they may have um, a, a minor outbreak of um, warts in the infected area. Other people are gonna be plagued with this and uh, I do apologize for the photos that I put in the outline there. They're pretty gnarly. Uh, but the real significance of this virus is that there are some strains that have uh, been linked to cervical cancers. As a matter of fact, in my notes I have here, um, I think you've got it too, strains um, uh, human papillomavirus 16 and 18, strains 16 and 18 are responsible for about 70% of cervical cancers. So there is our main reason for concern. Uh, so a, um, a vaccine was developed, uh, there are actually a couple of them, Gardasil is one of them, I guess I'll talk about that one, uh, to, um, uh, the intent was originally to vaccinate young women uh, and uh, the um, introduction of this vaccine did meet with um, quite a bit of resistance on the part of some people. There were some folks that felt that by vaccinating their daughters with this uh, Gardasil that it was in some way uh, promoting promiscuity. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't see the link, but I, I do respect um, other people's uh, feelings on this matter. Uh, but um, as time progressed, healthcare officials thought, hmm, maybe we should also vaccinate males. Uh, and so uh, males, uh, young males are vaccinated as well. As of 2014, FDA had approved um, a Gardasil 9, and their recommendation was that that be given to uh, women between 9 and 26 years of age and men between 9 and 15 years of age. Now, the reason that it's important to vaccinate people as young as possible is that the vast majority of people will become infected with this and possibly other viruses during their first intimate encounter. And so we need to vaccinate people before their first intimate encounter. Uh, and so um, the possible prevention of um, most, there are, I believe it's over a half a million cases of cervical cancer a year in the U.S. Uh, to prevent many of those, if not all of them, uh, sounds like a pretty good, um, pretty good idea to me. All right, also in this family uh, is the polyomavirus. I'm, I'm not gonna say much on this one. Causes a variety of tumors in animals. Um, most humans infected in childhood, usually not a problem unless the patient becomes seriously immunocompromised, um, such as uh, maybe a person that is a, a recipient of an organ uh, in a transplant situation. Those folks would have to take, uh, in almost all cases, immunosuppressive drugs for the rest of their life. And so um, this virus and other potential pathogens could be a serious problem for them. Uh, and in people that are seriously immunocompromised, it can cause, um, I've got some notes here, kidney failure or um, progressive multifocal uh, leukoencephalitis, which means large sponge-like holes form in the brain and that's never good. Okay, uh, next family of DNA viruses are the adenoviridae family, or is the adenoviridae family, and uh, double-stranded, no envelope with this group. Um, adenovirus or adenovirus um, 
is the only example that I was going to just briefly mention in this family. And um, there are strains uh, 1 to 57. And uh, this uh, particular virus has spikes on its uh, surface that aid in the infection process. And it can cause respiratory infections that, that in some cases are serious. Okay, I'm moving on to the Pox viridae family. My notes say double-stranded DNA with an envelope. Um, in this group, we have um, the virus that causes the disease known as um, smallpox, and also one that is very closely related that causes cowpox. Now, you guys had to read a little history um, in the beginning of the semester, and so you read the story about Edward Jenner. Um, he was um, a physician, and uh, there was um, you know major outbreak of smallpox in Europe, and he would travel from one family to another trying to help the people. And uh, Jenner noticed that uh, there was a, um, a young milkmaid who was caring for her sick family. And he asked her, why is it that you don't get infected with smallpox? And she explained to him that she'd had cowpox before. Okay, these folks had no idea what viruses were at this point, but Jenner was smart enough uh, to make the connection. And so he is credited with developing... Um, um, other than the Chinese, uh, a vaccine for smallpox that really did uh, change the course of history. All right, let's go ahead and switch gears and let's at least start our survey of RNA viruses. Uh, let me get caught up in your outline. I'd just like to see what I've given you and what you need to fill in. All right. Oh, and there are some good pictures in the outline. Uh, there is a young child that was a smallpox victim. Um, you take a look at that and you can see the, uh, the, the just devastating damage uh, done, I mean, not only internally, but to the, uh, the skin in the form of these blisters. And I also wanted to mention that um, when Europeans first came to North America, the native population here, had not been exposed to this virus. And by the time Europeans made it to the United States, um, the, the disease had made a number of passes um, through, um, through that population. And as is often true when a pathogen makes several passes through a population, its virulence declines. So some innate or herd immunity um, had uh, developed in many uh, Europeans. But when they came to North America, the native population here had no exposure, had no previous exposure. They were naive to this virus. And so the mortality rate was extremely high. Um, an interesting and sad bit of history that you perhaps might want to explore. Okay, so um, RNA viruses, um, Picornaviridae family is the first on my list. And I think that I'll end with this one. And this is uh, the, um, uh, the virus that causes polio. Um, all right, some notes, and you've got some bullets you can fill in here. Um, first of all, is that only about 1% of infections with the polio virus are actually going to uh, progress to the paralytic form of the disease. And I think there's a, yeah, there's a photo of a little girl uh, that was probably taken in the 30s or the 40s, and I guess you could say she was a classic um, polio victim. Um, there was um, atrophy of muscles, and so she wears braces on her legs and has to walk with crutches. But only about 1% of infections um, would progress to the paralytic form of the disease. Mild cases of polio, we're going to see things like a sore throat, headache, fever, and nausea. Uh, the virus is transmitted in the fecal material of the infected individual. Uh, now, again, vaccines have uh, uh, changed the course of history. In 1955, Jonas Salk produced uh, the first vaccine for polio. It was a, um, a killed version of the, um, of the virus. So the virus was um, either um, heated to kill it or exposed to chemicals, I don't recall which, so that the virus was complete, but it was dead, okay? So that's what the vaccine, uh, the nature of the vaccine was that Salk um, introduced in 55. And in 1963, Sabin uh, produced the first attenuated live vaccine. Attenuated means that uh, the virus has been weakened, all right? And um, that vaccine, while it does have a greater risk 
of the patient contracting the disease, very rare people, um, it does provide a higher level of immunity against the disease. And so um, polio in developed nations where sanitation is generally good, I mean, we have adequate sewage treatment facilities, uh, the drinking water supply is, um, is safe, polio is virtually unheard of in those parts of the world, but it is still a problem in parts of the world where those conditions uh, do not prevail. And once again, you guys, vaccination. This is a disease that we could potentially eradicate from our planet uh, like we did with smallpox. All right, I'm gonna break for now. And you know, I didn't talk about um, smallpox vaccine uh, and the eradication of that virus. So why don't I go ahead and I'll um, talk about that first thing in the next segment. All right, thanks for watching. Thanks for your patience. I'll be back. Hello. Okay, I looked at my notes and I realized I only had two more entries to finish up uh, the Picornaviridae family. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to um, um, wedge this into the video. All right, so um, second on my list is the rhinovirus. And this is a large group, uh, over a hundred strains that causes what we refer to as the common cold. And we've all um, had them before. Um, most of us have had many colds, but this is a virus that is going to thrive in temperatures that are slightly lower than core body temperature. So uh, in the nose is ideal, just a little bit cooler there. Now, here are three reasons why colds are so common. First of all is we don't have any drugs to cure the common cold. Uh, hopefully that will be coming down the pipeline soon, but it's a rather complicated problem, so maybe not. Uh, the second reason is the diversity of strains of rhinovirus. Like I said, over 100 strains. I've even read possibly as many as 200 strains. I don't think anybody, uh, I don't think there's been a consensus reached on that. And then uh, the third reason why colds are so common is a lack of what we call durable immunity. So that means long-lasting, lifelong immunity. Uh, when you are infected with a cold virus, one of the strains of cold virus, uh, and upon recovery, you will be immune to that strain for months to maybe years, but not your entire life. So just to recap, uh, three reasons why colds are so common is a lack of drugs to cure the common cold, diversity of strains of rhinovirus, and a lack of durable immunity. immunity. Okay, and then the third example is, uh, in, I'm still in the uh, Picornaviridae uh, family, uh, would be the uh, enteroviruses, and over 100 types um, in this group as well, causing, my notes say, 10 to 15 million infections a year. That's just in the United States. Most of the time, no big deal. Um, infections may be asymptomatic or subclinical. Uh, sometimes these infections are referred to as summer colds because we have a higher incidence that time of year. Uh, when symptoms are seen, we're going to see fever, runny nose, cough, maybe a little skin rash. And uh, there are two strains, though, that have um, proven to be significant strains, 68 and 71. They are associated with um, potentially severe neurologic symptoms, uh, including a polio-like paralysis. In the summer of 2014, there were a number of cases with uh, children with polio-like symptoms caused by viruses in this group. Okay, I haven't forgotten about the smallpox vaccine. I'll pick that up in the next video. Thanks.